where is everyone? Most movies have alien life coming to Earth, whether for resources to pick a fight or just hang out. And though there is a massive technological gap between us with them being the more advanced, we always overcome through the power of love or whatever. But there's a lot to unpack there, especially from a technological standpoint. I'm Ashley Christine and here's how it works. In the 1950s, a group of scientists sat down for lunch at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. Yes, the same place where Oppenheimer and friends built the atomic bomb a decade earlier. At first, they talked about faster than light travel and how to do it, when the conversation shifted to life in the universe. This is when Enrico Fermi, an Italian scientist who had won the Nobel Prize in Physics and is regarded as one of the chief architects of the nuclear age, asked, where is everybody? This stirred a pretty heated debate. Fermi said that the probability of Earth-like planets due to the sheer population size in in the universe means that we should have been visited tons of times by now and yet none have come. This is the Fermi paradox. There have been many proposals to answer the paradox over the years, but first you'll want to have a better understanding of the numbers. Life doesn't just sprout up from nowhere or from someone's ribs. There's a lot that needs to happen. Our galaxy is about 13 billion years old, and in the beginning, it would have been too chaotic and violent for life to occur. The area that would become our solar system was full of dust and gas, but would eventually collapse into a star and eight planets, eight. That would have also been too violent for life to develop because everything was still getting hit with rocks and debris in a period called the late heavy bombardment around 4 billion years ago. The first microbes appeared within just a few hundred million years of that, which in geological terms is pretty fast. Earth didn't have much oxygen at the time, but the first life forms didn't use it. They relied on arsenic, but when cyanobacteria evolved about a billion years later, which is this blue green stuff you find in water, it photosynthesized water and sunlight and released oxygen. This began what's called the Great Oxidation Event. It took a few hundred million years to build up enough oxygen in the atmosphere, but once it did, multi-celled organisms could evolve. And around a billion years after that, we have animal life. By the way, this cyanobacteria is one of the ideas for growing plants in a Mars station by mixing it in with the Martian regolith and basically doing what it did for Earth. It's no coincidence that the most abundant elements in the universe are also the same ones that we need to live. Life can't be built off a rare element because there needs to be enough of that element for a life form to physically build off of and to consume. We are carbon-based life forms because Earth is a carbon planet. It is the fourth most common element in the universe even Venus has a ton of carbon, so it's pretty easy to see how we're made of it. We also breathe oxygen, which just so happens to be the third most common element in the universe. Even water, a molecule, not an element, is relatively abundant, being on Enceladus, Europa, Titan, and even in the form of ice on Mars. To be fair, these elements have to be in a certain form. Oxygen, or O1, like what you see on a periodic table, is not what we breathe, it's too reactive. We breathe O2, which is a molecule, which are two bonded oxygen atoms. Bonded, they are more stable than when they're apart. It's like baking a cake. You might have plenty of baking soda and eggs, but without the exact right amount of each, you will not get a fluffy cake. And even then, it may not be tasty. <laughs> Out of the billions of species that have existed on Earth, only one was tasty enough to build a spaceship. The takeaway here is that life on its own doesn't need much. The ingredients are relatively abundant. But to get a fluffy cake or complex life with brains that are self-aware requires an entirely different set of circumstances that need to occur just right. For example, you can't have a major asteroid collision or an old star that becomes unstable. The planet needs enough time to get the ball rolling. But in a universe with plenty of time, surely someone somewhere had a stable enough environment to develop technology. The Drake Equation was the brainchild of astrophysicist Frank Drake, who first mentioned the idea in 1961. It's an estimate for how many civilizations there should be within our galaxy, just our galaxy. And by civilizations, we mean a community with emissions that we could detect, like radio waves or energy pulses of some kind. Basically, something that stars and rocks wouldn't be doing on their own. The first variable, R, which is the rate of formation of stars, so how many stars are being made each year in the galaxy. Estimates here fluctuate, but they're between one to 10 every year. 
This is an important factor because without a star, there is no engine to create heat and elements for planets and all the things that keep this circus running. F sub P is the fraction of those stars with planets. It's hard to imagine now, but for a long time, it was believed that solar systems like ours were pretty rare, that stars were alone or paired with another star and didn't usually have planets. It wasn't until 1992 that the first exoplanet was confirmed. Since then, we've found thousands more, and some have looked pretty promising. N sub E is the number of planets per solar system that have an environment suitable enough for life. Now, this doesn't mean there is life. We haven't gotten there yet. This is just the number of planets that aren't absolutely terrible. Whether it's life as we know it or not, there does need to be an environment that allows chemical processes of some kind to occur so that something can be made. F sub E, or sub L, depending on your source, is the fraction of suitable planets on which life actually appears. F sub i is the fraction of those planets with intelligent life, and F sub c is the fraction of that life that has been able to develop technology. L is the average length of time all those civilizations are producing detectable signals, Although recent studies suggest eliminating this variable because it doesn't matter if we can detect them, we just want to know if they ever existed, even if it's billions of years before us. If you multiply all this together using the estimates from the 1960s, that still leaves you with 10,000 civilizations in the galaxy. And this doesn't even take into consideration the billions of other galaxies, which just increases the odds. But it's not reliable, not because of the equation itself, but because we don't fully understand which values to input for each variable. The thing is, this can't equal zero because we exist. The fact that we're alive means it's not an impossibility. Statistically speaking, if a thing occurs once, it can probably occur again with enough tries. We've only been able to map out a small section of our galaxy, and even with the power of the James Webb Telescope, we can't see down onto the surface of any exoplanet to prove one way or another. We are quite literally working in the dark. The dark force is a conjecture where there is intelligent life, but they're all hiding out of fear of mutual destruction. Like a literal dark force where even the hunters are quiet because they don't want to be seen by other predators. The term came from a science fiction book written in 2008 by Chinese author Sushin Liu. You might recognize it as the sequel to The Three Body Problem, which is currently a very popular Netflix series. Generally, life on Earth survives by competition, where we're all trying to live, acquire resources, and reproduce. The the problem is nearby life forms like lions and tigers and bears who also have the same goals. Fortunately for humans, we have found a way to completely dominate the nearby resources at the low price of 150 extinctions a day. Even if a species isn't as violent or all consuming as we are, they still would have had at least begun on a planet or moon that had X number of resources because planets are isolated by space. A species might be able to acquire more resources by synthesizing or extracting them from other planets later, but at some point early on, competition was likely present. And yet at the same time, cooperation is what allowed our species to thrive in the first place. We have civilization because for the most part, we have agreed on rules and order, and we do resolve our problems far more often than we drop a bomb on them. An advanced civilization would have also had to discover cooperation in order to develop, design, and construct anything capable of interstellar travel. There are many theories as to why we haven't seen signs of alien life, that they're so advanced they couldn't be bothered with us, like an ant colony on the other side of the planet that you and I are never going to visit, they just don't find us that interesting. Or that there used to be a lot of civilizations in the universe and humans are now at the tail end of what was once a golden age of intelligent life. Or maybe they never existed. Or maybe they do, but haven't developed technology because they're single-celled organisms. Or simply, no one knows we're here. For billions of years, our section of the galaxy was an essential dead zone with no technological emissions of any kind. Earth was a rock, like any other rock, floating around a bunch of other rocks. It wasn't until around 200 years ago that we started emitting radio signals, which travel at the speed of light, but 200 light years isn't very far. It's reasonable to assume that if life is out there, they have no idea we're here. As Arthur C. Clarke said, there are two possibilities. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. <laughs> Sleep in fear.
A footnote I'd like to add because I found it pretty interesting, but I couldn't find the right spot in this video to put it. For you history buffs, the where is everybody conversation in Los Alamos was something everybody present that day almost forgot about. Enrico Fermi died a couple years after that, and it wasn't a conversation that was brought up much again. Carl Sagan mentioned it, but when asked, he couldn't remember who he had heard the story from either. I found a series of letters from 1984 between a young scientist named Eric Jones at Los Alamos and each of the scientists who were at the lunch that day and were still alive. One of them was Dr. Edward Teller, who was this character in Oppenheimer. Jones asked them if they could confirm that the story is true and did Fermi really hash out this paradox? And they all responded separately saying, yeah, but we don't remember much else. I included a link in the description below if you wanted to check it out. Thank you.